Welcome to Radio Eden and to our talk, Challenging Evolution. Is the universe really that old? So <clears throat> we'll be looking at quite a number of things today. Um, the, uh, this talk is based on the book, It is a Young Earth After All, by Paul Ackermann. The presenter, that's myself, that's uh, Michael Schomborn. And uh, my background, I'm an RF engineer, so it's a radio frequency engineer. So I know a lot about radio. Uh, and I've been a lecturer for the last 20 years in engineering and computer networking and network security. The, uh, the main point I need to make is uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm an engineer. And uh, with this talk, I don't um, pretend to be a scientist. So um, please don't uh, tell me that I should go back and do my science. I'm just presenting. That's all I'm doing. I'm presenting what other scientists have come up with. Um, this is a Radio Eden production. Uh, and the website is www.radioeden.com. Okay, now this talk is um, for the radio station as well as for YouTube as well. So for radio listeners, apologies uh, that you can't see the PowerPoint, but you can go to www.radioeden.tv and check out our YouTube channel and uh, you can find this talk there. I'm just going to go back. It's called Challenging Evolution. Is the universe really that old? So that is uh, the talk. Okay, um, why this talk? There's a misconception of the universe. Uh, a lot of people think that the universe is really, really old. The, the figure which is uh, sort of floating about and which is accepted by um, a lot of people within the scientific community is uh, 4.5 billion years. Again, 4.5 billion. So that's 4,500 million years. So that's that's a really, really big figure. And uh, we're going to look at, at this figure in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, why this figure? It's a good question. Many evolutionists, evolutionists say uh, need a lot of time for evolution to take place. Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense. Why? Because uh, we haven't really observed any any evolution since the whole research uh, started. Any uh, transition from one species to another, any uh, series of muta mutations which um, took one life form to a higher life form. We haven't observed anything like this in the last 150 years. So obviously there needs to be a long time span if uh, these guys want to be proven right. Okay, um, it is necessary to challenge misconceptions with the evidence we find around us. That's very important. It's a lot of misconceptions. There's a lot of evidence which points to a different scenario. And we need to use this evidence to challenge this. In the end, we all want to find out the truth. In the end, uh, we want to know what is right and what is not right. We need to understand our origins to have a chance in securing our future. Um, I, I did another talk and I um, about moon dust and preceding the moon dust talk, I, I mentioned a lot about the significance of whether creation is true or whether evolution is true, whether we are um, made in the image of God or whether we are a descendant of a monkey or the monkey and us, we've got a common ancestor. So th there's quite a, a huge significance in this, um, in this question. If we are just an animal, a sophisticated animal, we come, we go, and we there's no meaning to our lives. But if we are created in the image of God, suddenly there's a big meaning to our lives. And ultimately, we have to be answerable to the one who has created us. Okay, what we will discuss in this uh, talk is the universe, clocks in the universe. So there are a lot of clocks around us, uh, and we're going to look at some of them in a minute. Uh, we look at the moon dust problem. Um, we look at meteors, so the problem with the meteors in fossilized layers. Uh, and to be more precise, we look at the problem why there aren't any meteors in fossilized layers. Um, we look at the pointing Robertson effect, uh, which should do quite a lot in, in our universe, in our solar system, over 4.5 billion years. So if you assume that this is a correct age for our solar system. And uh, we're going to look at what, what we're actually seeing um, based on the law of physics, you know, does it all add up or does it not add up? Uh, we're going to look at a comet's life cycle, uh, another interesting aspect. We've got comets going in and out, and uh, what, what's happening with these comets, you know? Um, do they fit into this concept of 6.5 or 4.5 billion years? We have got 
other bizarre things in our solar system, and we, we, we quickly, quickly refer to them. Uh, one of them is volcanoes on uh, moons in the outer solar system. Not outer solar system, almost outer, but anyway, we're going to talk about this later. And then we've got uh, some problems with uh, Saturn's rings as well. Okay, first of all, clocks. We have got clocks in the universe, and there are tons of clocks around us, and if we want to measure... Uh, the time uh, we have been around or what is being going on here, we need to look at these clocks. Um, so, so I mean, there, there are many of them. First of all, let me just uh, show you the uh, egg timer here. We've got an egg timer, and uh, and, and that's pretty much just, uh, defines how a clock works. We've got a substance. The substance goes from the upper ball into the uh, lower ball at a steady rate. And it takes a, a certain amount of time for it to do so. So, for example, five minutes for an egg timer, uh, or a bit less, a bit more. Um, and anyway, that is a time measurement uh, which we can use to, to simply measure time. We've got other clocks as well, which are totally different. So, for example, we've got a fuse for explosive devices. So, if you've got a bar of dynamite and you're trying to blast some stone away in a mine... Um, you have a long fuse, and the, the longer the fuse, the longer it takes for the fuse to uh, ignite and and to burn up and eventually to um, ignite the explosives. Um, and, and so we can determine how long a fuse has been burning, how much time has been, been going around. We've got uh, our standard clocks, and then we've also got really interesting stuff as well, and there's loads of it around in nature. Uh, so let's have a look at this tree, the slice of a tree, of a, uh, this a section of a tree trunk. And um, what you can see is, you can see uh, which years were good, which years were not so good. Um, you can see uh, drought periods and periods of very lots of rain and lots of sunshine, so the tree could grow really well. And, um, and that's quite amazing because a tree can give you an idea of, uh, can, can, can let you look back into time of what the climate was like. Okay, and we have got other clocks as well. We've got erosion. Sometimes erosion is at a steady rate. And uh, if that is the case, we can um, maybe make a prediction of how old something is. Uh, we've got decay, um, pretty much in everything. Uh, we could look at humans, for example. Um, we can tell by looking at a human how old uh, somebody is. So if the face is wrinkly and uh, there are lots of gray, gray hair and... Um, uh, the person generally generally looks old, and we know maybe 60, 70, or 80. If uh, the person looks very young and dynamic, clear skin, and um, we might estimate a person to be 20 or 30 years old, or if a person is very small, yeah, we uh, make our judgments. So these are basically time clocks um, where we can read time and we can see how much time has passed. Um, and again, in the universe, there are clocks all over. There are indicators of how long things have been around and uh, what has been happening in, in times gone by. We've got deposits as a clock. Yeah? So um, uh, it's the opposite to erosion. So if you've got a lake, deposits settle down. So we can make prediction of predictions of how long a lake has been around and um, how many years based on the amount of sediment and the amount of uh, um, deposits which have been put in there. And then we've got something like dust clocks as well. So if you look at your windowsill, if you look at mine right now, I'm just doing it behind me, there's a windowsill, and I can see it hasn't been dusted, and I can run my finger through and right into the dust help. But um, that really needs doing, and I should be doing it. But anyway, that is uh, just an example of uh, dust clocks you know, giving an indication of how long something is not being dusted by the amount of dust that's uh, there. Obviously, all clocks assume that uh, there's a constant rate of uh, decay uh, or a deposit or whatever it may be, but that the rate is constant. Sometimes it's not constant or very often it's not constant. And so uh, we get into the world of estimation or guesstimation. Okay, let's uh, look on. Dust clock, dust is all around us, all around us. It settles at a steady rate. If more dust is around, it settles faster. So for example, if uh, I were to break down a wall, uh, there would be a lot more dust around in, uh, in the whole house. And maybe um, um, I've, I've once done this, I did a loft out in, in a house and in one day I had as much dust on the windowsill as it would normally collect in a year. So, 
it's sometimes a problem. So it's very difficult to estimate because conditions rarely stay the same, environmental conditions especially, especially uh, for extended period of times, but they do change over time. Uh, nevertheless, it's possible to determine maybe when dusting took place. So for example, if there's no dust at all on the windowsill, I could say, yes, some time ago, maybe a month or a week ago, somebody has been dusting here, somebody was here. So uh, you can normally tell or generally tell when a house has been lived in, and you can also tell when a house has not been lived in because of um, the dirt, the dust and, and, and other indicators. Okay, it's just important to, to sort of bear this in mind um, and also to encourage you to look around in, in nature and to look for these clocks, which, which tell you a little bit about, um, about the earth and about, about nature. Okay, let's go further with the dust. We've got something which is called cosmic dust, and they are um, just stuff which mini meteor meteors, small particles which are blown onto earth or blown onto the moon as well. Uh, some of them are called micrometeorites, and we can see them here, and you can see it's a little bit shiny. Um, uh, for our radio listeners, I'm just pointing to a, a picture of a micrometeorite, and, and you can see that it looks a bit like, uh, you know, like a nugget, almost like a gold nugget, but bear in mind, uh, the picture is blown up, and, and it's a really tiny particle, um, barely visible with the human eye. But uh, when you look close at it and you see the shininess of this um, meteorite, uh, it's actually nickel. Uh, there's nickel and cobalt, which um, these meteorites have got a high quantity, a high concentration of. And so um, we know that uh, they're cosmic because uh, the materials we find on the Earth contain a lot less nickel, an awful lot less nickel, uh, than uh, the meteorites which we get from space. Uh, then we've got something else, which is called Brownlee particles. And uh, that's my presentation went a bit crazy there. Okay, back to the right slide. Uh, Brownlee particles, um, they look like fluffy little bits. Um, and they are supposed to be remnants from comets. When comets around the sun start burning up and uh, disintegrate, um, they release a lot of small particles. And these Brownlee particles are remnants from, from, from old comets. Okay, we're going to look at it a, a little bit later. There are sort of two different types of cosmic dust. One, there's quite a small quantity around, and the other one, there's quite a big quantity. So if you start collecting cosmic dust, you get um, a tiny fraction of Brownlee particles, but you get a lot of micrometeorites. Okay, meteorites, as mentioned before, are high in nickel content. And if I collect dust in the high atmospheres, uh, that's one way of differentiating between uh, dust from outer space or from the solar system, as opposed to dust which is uh, uh, from the Earth. Uh, there are various estimates of on how much meteorite material is falling to the Earth each year. And in a minute, we're going to look at them. Uh, but to sort of uh, go from one extreme to the other, the highest figure is 14 million tons. And then over time, they came down to about 10,000 10, tons per year. So it's quite a huge difference on the calculations which have been um, sort of circulating in the uh, in the scientific community over the last sort of 40 50 years uh, the earth and the moon are in the same path hence similar amounts of dust should be found on the moon as well and this is where the whole moon dust idea comes from so we should find quite a lot of dust on the moon but we are not and therefore uh, there's the argument that that the moon possibly is not that old what what people make out to what people make it out to be or scientists make it out to be what are the differences between dust collecting on the Earth and on the Moon? You now, the Earth has got erosion through weather, wind, water, and there's also geological activity. So some of the dust which would settle down here would be washed away, blown away, end up in the sea, um, being gobbled up by geological processes. So it would uh, sort of disappear in the general um, change uh, which is taking place on the Earth. Now, the Moon is a bit different. Uh, the moon hasn't got any air, there's no wind on the moon, there's no weather, there is no geological activity. The moon is supposed to be a dead planet, so there are no volcanoes or anything like that on, on the moon. Uh, also, there's no erosion. So pretty much uh, whatever element of dust falls on the moon stays on the moon. And it's a bit like the uh, astronauts' footprints. Uh, they'll be there for a very, very long time, uh, and uh, not much is going to change up there. Other processes we have are strong radiation from the sun. 
So that's on the moon, yeah, other processes. So we don't have weather, but we've got other processes. Uh, we've got meteor strikes, large meteor strikes, which uh, if they hit something would throw a lot of debris up, uh, up, and then it would settle down on the uh, surface of the moon again. But uh, it would probably cause bro rocks to break up and um, uh, fragment into smaller particles. Um, we've got a massive change in temperature as well. So we've got the day side and the night side and a couple of hundred de degrees in difference. So um, the uh, some of the um, um, some of the rocks which we have would start breaking down due to the, the massive temperature differences. So they would expand in the in the in the heat, and then when it gets to the lunar night, they would contract, and so eventually uh, dust will be generated that way as well. Now, as the rocks are breaking down, you would expect that there is even more dust than just the cosmic dust dust falling on the moon and therefore there are kind of wild ideas about you know how much dust is on the moon and um, there are a couple of scientists which came up with uh, very very interesting um, ideas okay cosmic dust when did the research start it started in 1957 uh, the guy is called Hans Petersen he is uh, from the Swedish Oceanographic Institute and he collected dust from a mountain in Hawaii at a height of, of roughly about 3,500 meters above sea level. Now, Hawaii is in the middle of the Pacific, so there's no landmass nearby. If there's any dust floating about, the Pacific would pretty much gobble it up. And uh, so he thought high at the mountain, high above the Pacific is a good place to collect dust and um, cosmic dust, uh, and it being fairly unpolluted from... Uh, earthly dust. He also looked, when he collected his dust, he looked for the nickel content, knowing that meteorites uh, from our solar system are very high in nickel, whereas uh, the the uh, the rocks and the dust from Earth is very low in nickel. And so uh, he could um, determine, he could determine um, the amount of cosmic dust which he has actually collected yeah. and uh, separate the the earthly dust from it. Now, um, his research suggested that um, per year there are somewhere between 5 and 14 million tons of dust settling on the earth. Okay, I repeat, it's between 5 and 14 million tons per year settling on the earth. Now, he assumed that the earth had an age of about 4.5 billion years and uh, if providing or assuming that the uh, rate of dust is the same throughout this period, there should have been uh, a dust layer of about 20 meters or more on Earth. Now, the dust layer on the moon, since the Earth and moon are on the same path, would have been very similar. So there, there might be an idea, yes, you know, there might be um, 10 meters or maybe because gravity is a little bit less, but there should be significantly more than, than there actually is on the moon. Okay, let's uh, go a little bit further with those figures. Uh, initially, his ideas, Patterson's ideas, were widely accepted by the scientific community, and uh, Isaac Asimov confirmed his research as well. So he's another name in this uh, dust uh, debate. Uh, later on, we got uh, a guy called F.G. Watson from uh, of Harvard University, and he estimated the meteoric impact uh, to be somewhere between 0.3 and 3.6 million tons per year. So 300,000 tons to uh, 3.6 million tons per, per year. Uh, and he, did a, he based his research on uh, deep sea sediments, um, which, which would point roughly to that figure, a lower figure somewhat. There was also some other research taking place, and uh, somebody, uh, some of the explorers who went to the South Pole, uh, they were drilling for ice cores, and in these ice cores, they had two time markers. And one marker was a volcano outbreak in the mid-1800s, and the other one was a nuclear test in the, in the 50s, which could be seen in the ice. And uh, so they knew, a half from there to there is about 100 years. Let's see how much cosmic dust is in the ice. And uh, based on the dust they found, they estimated the, um, the annual uh, descent of cosmic dust to be about 400 thousand tons per year again 400,000 tons per year 0.4 million tons per year so that's quite a big figure so even when you 
assume 20 meters based on uh, sort of 10 million tons of dust per year, um, then you're still looking, even though it's, it's only 10%, but you're still looking at uh, several meters of dust. So again, on the moon, we should find something similar. We should find maybe half a meter, meter, several meters of dust over this long period of time, over 4.5 billion years. Bearing in mind that the dust at the beginning of the universe, at the beginning of the solar system, would most likely have been significantly higher than what it is what it is now. And we're going to look at some effects as well, which should have mopped up a lot of the dust. So if you take these effects into account, there should have been uh, a lot more dust. Yeah? And all these calculations, they're all based on a, on a constant uh, descent of, of the dust which is available. Uh, another guy by the name of Lütleton, he was a scientist, and he suggested that on the moon, the lunar dust layer should be several miles deep uh, due to the dust flow and breakdown of rocks. So he said, you've got all these mountains on the moon, and um, if the dust settles in, in on the higher mountains, over time it'll gradually sort of flow down, very slowly, but it'll come down and it'll start collecting in the plains of the moon. So if a, a lunar lander gets onto some altitude, might be okay, but if, he's, if he uh, landes somewhere, lands somewhere in the plain, plains, then uh, there will be a problem with dust yeah, because there might be a mile, a mile of dust or something. That's, that's what he said. Now, this was a research going sort of um, around in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, and, and then in 65, it radically changed. And we're going to see in a minute why. Okay, uh, just let me briefly go back to the Brownlee elements. Uh, they are supposed to be um, sort of remnants of comets, which started burning up around the sun and um, release a lot of particles. And these particles, they are um, in, uh, you know, still in the orbit of the comet. And so um, the Earth starts picking them up as the Earth travels around the sun. And the influx of these particles, the so-called Brownie particles, um, is supposed to be about 10,000 tons. Yeah. And some researchers went into this and they came up with this figure. So it's, it's significantly lower. So again, we are looking at uh, even the conservative figures we have. We are still talking about 400,000 tons per year, uh, up to about 16 million tons per year, 14 million tons per year. So it's quite, quite vast figures. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look. So the moon landings took place. <clears throat> and um, they had to take place because Kennedy in the early 60s said that they will put a man on the moon by the end of the 60s, and this is to spite the uh, enemy at the time. And um, and NASA put a lot of effort, they got a lot of funding to, to try and make this possible. Um, because of all the scientific debate, uh, NASA, was, NASA was worried about spacecraft disappearing in the dust on the surface of the moon. Yeah, so they thought, what are we gonna do? We can't have this, that suddenly our astronauts just disappear below the, the visible surface. So they had orbiters and they could see the surface of the moon and they could take pictures, but they saw dust, but they didn't know how deep the dust was. So they had a, a crash landing on the moon, a, a controlled crash landing, <coughs> which gave some data, suggesting that it's maybe not so much a problem. And then they had an unmanned landing on the moon as well. Um, and, and, and there they found that it wasn't really a problem at all. They, they only had about uh, less than an inch of dust on the moon. Okay, just bear in mind, we had 20 meters, and then if you look at the conservative elements, we look at, at about maybe one meter or two meters of dust, and now we've got less than a centimeter. It's quite interesting when you, when you look at these figures. Okay, so uh, probes were sent to the moon by 1965, confirming that predictions about big, you know, massive dust layers were not correct, and that dust is not a real problem. Okay, so again, science, yeah? Science should not be based on assumptions. Science should be based on facts. Okay, so we've got the scenario, they assume because of evolution, the Earth must be really, really old, otherwise it, it just couldn't take place. And so they come up with this figure of 4.5 billion years. So this figure is not going to be twiddled about, that's, that's taken as, as fact, even though there are no real, there's no real evidence to, to substantiate this fact, whether it's 1 billion or maybe it's 10 billion years old, nobody really knows. Yeah. The next thing is they find out there's, there's no dust on the moon. There should be a lot more dust on there, but it's hardly any any on the moon. And um, and then by 1965, 
um, they then suddenly start to change their signs and they come up with totally different figures. Let's have a look. Um, the scientists came up with new figures once it was known that there was less dust on the moon than expected. And suddenly the figures weren't, uh, you know, half a million to, to 15 million tons a year, but they came down to 10,000 tons a year. Yeah. The interesting thing as well is that Brownlee came up with the same figure for just the Brownlee elements, which is not meteoric dust, just the Brownlee elements, but it's a different type of dust. It's just the stuff comets is, is made up of. And, and scientists just lunched on and uh, latched on and they came up with this 10,000 10, tons a year figure. And then it would roughly work out with just having a little, literally a little dusting of dust on the moon and, and not more than that. Interesting. Very, very interesting. So the, um, the science has changed to make it fit the facts and, and their, their beliefs, their belief system. Um, reality would be if you use a dust clock, um, okay, we, we know there's so much dust this time around. We think there was more dust in, 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 uh, in previous times. Therefore, the Earth cannot possibly be 4.5 billion years old, but it must be younger. Otherwise, there would be more dust. That would be the logical conclusion, but, but they don't dare to, do this con to make this conclusion uh, because they say it cannot be true because otherwise evolution couldn't have happened. And, uh, and obviously, maybe it hasn't happened at all. And uh, therefore, we need to revisit all these, these aspects in, in science. Okay, the moon landing. Neil Armstrong, it's quite interesting. I've read um, the first words. I mean, you all know the words, you know, small step for man, but a big, big step for mankind. Um, he said some stuff before that he's just coming down the ladder and he's putting his first feet. And, and then he made a statement that there's no dust. And I, I saw the transcript some, some time ago was reading it, but it was interesting that he was concerned about the dust. On being asked what was his greatest worry when setting foot on the moon, Neil Armstrong said that uh, that it was basically the dust problem. He wasn't quite sure whether, you know, all the uh, consecutive ex experiments about the dust were actually true, and it wouldn't just disappear in a um, in in a mountain of dust. So anyway, he put his foot on the moon. Very thin layer of dust was found, which was predicted through prior landings and research that NASA did. And um, and then, as I mentioned before, science redefined their findings. The world is 4.5 billion years old. Dust on the moon is less than an inch or two. Hence, there cannot be more dust in space than what we can find or what we have found on the moon. That's basically the conclusion science made. So all the figures were adjusted to make it fit the facts. The, the, the facts which, uh, which they could see, which everybody could see on the moon. Okay, these are the moon landings. A man in the moon, uh, fantastic pictures. You can see the uh, footstep of one of the astronauts. Uh, I just moved the cursor over it. Uh, and um, uh, it's got to be there for a long, long time. Um, then you can see also the Earthrise is one of the most famous pictures. And I think it was taken from the lunar orbiter as it came round the uh, the back of the moon and it just saw the earth rise over the moon surface and then there's one point as well so the moon, lunar landings are about 50 years ago now and they put some reflectors on the moon for lasers so uh, institutes they can direct lasers on these reflectors and then they can uh, wait for the laser to bounce back and then based on um, uh, the, uh, the 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 time lag uh, they can actually determine the the distance of the moon between uh, Earth and Moon. Quite interesting experiment, but one thing which uh, would be more interesting if maybe in another 50 years time there's a slight layer of dust on the reflectors and they don't work as well anymore. If that is the case, then um, we, the creationists, stand corrected and the evolutionists say got it badly wrong. Okay, moon dust con conclusion. Yeah, I'm not going to dwell too too long on it, but it's 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 an interesting aspect. It's something everybody uh, can see and uh, has seen if uh, you watched uh, t TV in '69. Um, there's a lot of conflicting research which has been around. It's important to uh, point out research from uh, the old days and and see what scientists came up with, and also how science sci scientific community changed once it was proven wrong. Yeah, but but not to the extent that the assumptions, which are deeply flawed, i.e., an old Earth, were changed. But um, 
they they stuck with these assumptions, but they just started changing the data and they said it cannot be possible that there's that much dust around, otherwise we would see it. But the, the measurements, uh, sediments, the um, um, dust on the polar ice caps, yeah, and uh, dust in Hawaii, they they paint a completely different picture. So uh, it's something to to bear in mind and to, uh, to 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 look at this and just be open-minded about these things. Okay, um, concluding the whole matter. After four point five billion years, there should be more dust on the moon than just a few centimeters. It's a fact. Just um, more than what we see should be there, and we are not seeing it. Therefore, there must be something wrong, and there's something very fishy about it. Um, okay. My answer to that is that the, the dust on the moon suggests, or the lack of dust on the moon suggests creation um, and a young, young earth and a young moon uh, talking thousands of years rather than millions of years as opposed to an old age, uh, which is suggested as uh, 4.5 billion years. Okay, we've got the meteor clock and I'm going to sort of run through this pretty quickly. Uh, but I'm sure you can get the main ideas and the main points which I made here. Uh, we've got a rain gauge, um, and a rain gauge collects rain. And let's um, have a look. We're going to look at the evolutionist view with the fossil layers and creationist views, what fossil layers are all about. Uh, we look at steady meteorite impact, and uh, then we look at the problem. You can see two rain gauges here. I just moved the mouse over it. They're just like little containers with uh, uh, some markers on it. And uh, you can then see how much rain has been falling. So sometimes the meteorologists would say, oh, we fed uh, 80 centimeters of rain in a year. Uh, so if the amount of rain is pretty constant for a given area, uh, and you collect the rain faithfully year by year, and you don't, you take maybe average measurements, or you make sure it doesn't evaporate the water, uh, you could use it as a time marker. And you could so, say so much rain is being collected, hence it must be um, so long ago since this clock has been put up. Okay, next one. We've got meteorite impact. Um, you see the Arizona uh, crater with a massive meteor, meteor which uh, struck it in Arizona. Uh, we see two pictures, and these three pictures are all taken from Russia in Russia, and it's the Tungusta um, meteor which which hit uh, Russia recently. And here we've got just a frozen lake in Russia where meteor impact uh, broke the ice. No, uh, there's frequent meteor bombardment of the Earth. It's happening all the time. Most of the times, the meteor breaks up in the um, um, in the atmosphere, but uh, fragments of the meteor will always come down to Earth. Uh, the impact may not be that dramatic, but uh, it does get to the Earth, and, and that's where we can find them. Um, sometimes the Earth moves into the orbit path of uh, old comets, um, and we get a lot of pebbles and, and other things which are part of an old comet uh, being burnt up in the uh, in the atmosphere hitting eventually hitting the earth and having some sort of impact might be small and might be big uh, nevertheless if you take a long period of time for example you take a thousand years um, there should be some evidence of meteor impact uh, on on wherever you are yeah. now fossil layers and I'm going to link them together, the meteors and the fossil layers. Evolutionists think um, that they are old. So one layer of sediments goes on top of another layer of sediments and another layer of sediments. And, and each layer represents 100,000 years or, or something like that. And each sediment sort of describes that something is changing and, and so on. And so they come up with all these crafty ideas of uh, how old the Earth is. Okay, let's um, have a look. We've got some sediments here and you can see... Uh, what evolutionists think. So we've got all the different ages which each sediment uh, going coming from the uh, Creta I have to read it uh, Creta Sivus I'm not an expert in this um, you probably know the Jurassic layer, Jurassic Park this is where the dinosaurs lived and then right on for simple animals or simple life forms, the so-called Cumbrian layer and all the other layers in between um, they make a concession that sometimes it's not as straightforward cut because as uh, you've got tectonic plate movement, um, an earth mass is lifted up, some of it drops down, and so uh, it's sometimes difficult to determine which layer belongs to where. You can see the sedimentation in this picture here, uh, 
if you go to a quarry, for example, that's a picture of a quarry, uh, you can see all the different layers of uh, sediments uh, which have been put on top of one another. And then you see an example here of the type of life forms you can find in there. Down there is a picture of a mountain. Again, you can see all the sediments. And this is just a bucket where somebody tried to do his own little bit of sedimentation to illustrate how this works. Okay, creationist viewers, there's just a little bit of agreement with evolutionists about sedimentation. Yes, it takes place. Yes, it creates layers. Um, but fossils is sometimes a little bit different because when an organism dies, it starts decomposing. And in, in, in Earth terms, it's quite fast. If you've got a human body and it's, it's not, um, uh, the oxygen is not ex extracted or it's not excluded from the human body, um, the body will disintegrate within about uh, 10 to 20 years. So um, if I look at 100,000 years, there's not much left of it. Most of it will have been dissolved and will have um, been, you know, returned to dust, really. Um, as far as the fossil layers are concerned, the evolution, the creationist view is that it's a, a, a cosmic catastrophe which caused big land masses and, and a big turmoil being thrown on top of one another so that organisms got locked into um, a, a sediment layer and, uh, and with a lot of pressure started fossilizing. And because there's no oxygen or no, no air, um, bacterial decomposition could not take place. So that's, that's the, in, in a nutshell, the creationist view. So basically, when you fossilize something, it, it, it happens really, really fast. It doesn't happen over a long, long time. Um, okay, let's have a look at the next uh, thing. And there come some pictures which, which illustrate the theory. We've got a fossil here, which goes right through all the different layers. You can see the layers here. And then this fossil goes through, um, I guess I would say maybe about five, six layers. I leave it to you to judge yourself from the picture how many layers there are. An evolutionist might say, oh, each layer represents about 100,000 years or something like that. But we've got a fossil which goes, cuts right through all these layers and is fossilized, which seems to indicate that um, whatever happened to this fossil will have happened in a very short period of time, possibly days or months, but not in thousands or hundred thousands of years. It just doesn't work out, so it defies that. And then we've got two here. We've got a jellyfish here, which is fossilized. Again, a jellyfish is, is soft tissue all the way through. Uh, even you can see even the... Um, um, the um, tentacles of the jellyfish and um, it's not possible I mean a jellyfish would decompose within weeks and so um, um, fossilization that wouldn't be wouldn't really be possible uh, according to evolutionist terms and we've got a, um, an octopus here and again you can see all the uh, tentacles and you can see um, everything and, and again an octopus is just soft tissue uh, before it would have a chance to fossilized in evolutionist terms, you know, sediment falls down in the sediment, little sediment goes on top of it and grows up. Then you've got a, a layer of half a meter, which has taken um, 100,000 years to develop or 1,000 years to develop. Uh, that octopus would have been uh, rotted away and would have been decomposed straight away. So it must be something fast and something quick. I've heard, I haven't found it, I, I was looking for it, but I've heard um, another creationist talking about fossils which have been found of a shark giving birth. Yeah. No, that's not possible. I mean, that's something dramatic, something quick and fast must have happened to try and fossilize this animal in, in, in that speed. I put another thing in here as well. I couldn't resist this. Uh, let me just go back. There are two pictures of human footprints and dinosaur footprints in the same uh, solidified, I think one is a solidified riverbed, the other one as well. And, and it just doesn't make sense because dinosaurs and humans, they were umpteen million years apart. I'm not sure how many. Um, but this picture tends to prove that they were contemporary. Yeah. Dinosaurs and humans were contemporary. Now, if we accept this, we have to rewrite evolution totally. Yeah, nothing makes sense anymore. Anyway, there's plenty of evidence. I've heard about finds in, um, uh, in, in Canada, in Texas, and in France, where um, human remains were found nearby dinosaur remains, which seems to suggest that uh, they must have been around at the same time. So where are the meteors? And this is a problem when we talk about fossilization and fossil layers. There are no meteors. They aren't there. Big problem. 
Um, if they took millions of years to build up these fossilized layers and these uh, sedimented layers, then there should be a lot of meteors around. But what we find is that there are hardly any meteors found in these layers and, and, and nothing anywhere near to what is to be expected. Uh, bearing in mind, looking at the moon, that meteor bombardment um, in antiquity, sort of years before us, should have been a lot heavier than what it is now. There's nothing there in the fossil layer. So what are we going to do? Uh, creationist viewpoint is not a problem because um, they've been uh, these sediments have been created very, very fast in a matter of years, not in a matter of millions of years. From an evolutionist point of view, if, if this was millions of years, you should find meteors in these layers. They are not there. No meteors or not anywhere near what is to be expected. There might be one or two, but nothing to be expected. How do we know whether that's a meteor or not? Again, it's a nickel indicator. Uh, meteors have got a high contents in nickel. If there's no nickel in a stone or very low levels of nickel, uh, we pretty much know it's not a meteor. Okay. Um, right, that's the problem. Now, the next one is the pointing Robertson effect. And we have got about 15 minutes left, which means I have to rush a little bit, but... This effect is really interesting, and it, it's a clock which lets you know how long things have been around. It's a bit like they call it the solar janitor, um, the force which tidies everything up. It's the law of physics. You can observe the effect right now with the solar wind. I mean, some um, space people, they suggested to fit um, spacecraft with a solar sail, so they use the solar wind to, to drift through space. Um, And if it were an old solar system, 4.5 billion years old, then there should be some effects visible. Obviously, it should be older than, than that still, because uh, evolutionists said 4.5 billion years, that's where evolution started. So the Earth would have had some water and some, some, some soil and would be in orbit. And the rest uh, should have been there some, somewhat before that. Now, the effect can be used to measure time spans, the pointing Robertson effect. And this is how it goes. We've got a car and we've got rain, which falls vertically down. So the car is stationary the rain comes down vertically. To you, the rain appears to come down from the sky in a vertical manner. Now we start moving the car. So the car starts moving at high speed and suddenly the rain looks like it's coming towards you horizontally. And that is just a perception because uh, you are moving your car at speed. So this is the effect of speed, just a very crude diagram. So it looks like the rain is coming towards you. Uh, now, um, if you have this rain coming towards you and there's a force opposing the movement of your or the speed of your car um, it's going to have an impact it might be ever so small because the mass of a raindrop is very tiny and the mass of your car is a couple of tons so uh, a raindrop is not going to slow your car in any measurable manner but um, if you look at a fly a fly would um, certainly feel the impact yeah the fly has got just a little bit more mass than a raindrop and if the fly tried to fly towards or through the rain uh, she would also get the pointing robertson effect and slow down quite dramatically okay and, and that's in a celestial context has got a, a consequence okay pointing robertson small particles that moving hit a moving object yeah the object slows down a little bit yeah and if the object has got little mass it slows down even more so the forward motion um, is suffering a vertical bombardment of small particles will appear like an opposing force. So a big mass object, small impact, not much is going to happen. A low mass object, in, co in contrast, is quite a big impact and it will slow down. Now, if it's in orbit around the sun, um, the, uh, the slowly over time, it will get closer and closer to the sun until it gets uh, sucked in by the sun and it uh, gets destroyed. Uh, the result it, it generates is, um, you've probably seen this before in drug racing and, and things like that, it's, it's simply called drag. So uh, the drag will slow down the object, the orbit is going to change, it's going to get closer towards the sun, eventually the sun is, is going to gobble it up. Okay, solar wind, that's what the force is, um, and look at the pictures, there are a couple of pictures of the sun. Uh, the first one shows you um, small explosions on the sun and you get like masses of solar wind blurting out and um, here on earth what we can see is we get the northern lights the aurora borealis 
and um, I don't know whether you've ever seen it's quite amazing when you get a chance to see them like uh, curtains in the sky and uh, fancy colors as well but they are sort of in the northern and southern hemisphere uh, whenever there's an explosion on the sun and the earth is generally protected you can see this in this picture here uh, with the magnetic field so the particles are hurled towards the earth and the magnetic fields um, they redirect those particles and, and direct them away from the earth so we as humans are a little bit protected and we don't have to uh, you know dig ourselves into the ground to try and protect us from the sample radiation okay take this one step further we've got these tiny particles firing out out of the sun all the time and what we should find is and have a picture have a look at this picture here at the asteroid belt and if you look at the um um I'm just trying to look. Okay, if you look at the um, asteroid belt here and this diagram, you can't see it very well. It's a diagram with the orbits of the planets in our solar system and the asteroid belt is between Mars and Jupiter. And um, what we should find in the asteroid belt is that uh, because of this pointing Robertson effect, that the, the smaller stones and the smaller particles in the asteroid belt, they should move towards the inner part of the, the belt and the heavier stones, the heavier objects, should, should stay in the outer part whilst they are orbiting the sun. Yeah. That's what should happen, especially when we are talking time frames of 4.5 billion years. So this effect should have tidied up this belt quite nicely uh, with sorting all the rocks out, you know, with the heavy ones and the, uh, the, the particles one, which should come closer to the sun slowly. What we find, though, is um, when we look at the asteroid belt, it's not the case, but there's like a wild mixture of big objects on the inner part and small objects on the outer, outer part of the, uh, the asteroid belt. So, again, another suggestion that the Earth uh, or the, the solar system is not that old, that we are not talking billions of years, otherwise this effect would have happened. Um, but it hasn't happened, it's not there, or at least not yet. Maybe we have to wait another six billion years for it to, to take place. Um, okay, cosmic dust, that's the other thing as well, pointing Robertson, Robertson effect should have been mopped up. So the, the amount of cosmic dust in our solar system should be gradually be less. Again, that's an argument if uh, we are talking about an old universe, about 4.5 billion years, um, there should have been considerable considerable amount of dust, more than what we have today. Hence, there should be more dust on the moon, there should be more dust on, on the earth, which is not there and we can't find it. So, all in all, these things, they just point to a young solar system and uh, not an old solar system. If you, if you talk an old solar system, 4.5 billion years, then the figures just don't add up. If you look at a young solar system, and we are talking in thousands of years, then um, the figures do add up and it makes perfect sense. Okay, the next one is, and I've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to rush through. It's a comet's life cycle. What are comets? Uh, dust balls. Um, they've got a funny orbit, so we're going to look at that. Uh, when do we see them? They, they're most, most of the time, they're invisible. And then the big question is, how old are they? Yeah, and there's a problem as well, and we're going to, going to look at this in a minute. Are there different types of comets, and what happens if a comet comes to the end of its lifespan? Okay, here's a picture of a comet. Uh, NASA had the privilege of sending a, a, a probe near a comet, and so we could now see it for real what these things look like. Okay. Um, they're different to meteors, no nickel and no cobalt, mostly they're dust and ice, and hence we've got this term for comets which is uh, dirty snowballs. Uh, the orbit is highly elliptical, uh, it's quite precise the orbit, so we can predict when they come back. Most comets return in precise intervals, uh, they become visible, they, they are only visible when they are near the sun. Uh, the trail always points away from the sun, so it's not like the direction they fly, but it points away from the sun. Because of the solar particles which burn them up and the, the particles sort of uh, move away from the sun. The trails can be bigger than Jupiter in size, and it's quite amazing as well, Jupiter, absolutely massive planet, but when you look at a comet, uh, the whole plume which is behind the comet can be bigger than, than Jupiter. And that's the reason why we can see them quite, quite easily. Um, every orbit a comet does, uh, it loses a little bit of substance. Yeah. So we've got another picture of a comet. Quite spooky. Huh? 
hurtling through space. Okay, we've got a um, couple of orbits here of comets. So we've got the uh, Halley comet, which is every 76 years. We've got uh, Temple 1 com comet, which is about 5.5 years. And then there's another comet, which takes about 17,000 years to uh, come near the sun. Um, there are more, more comets around, uh, just an example of three of them, and they're all slightly different. You can see the um, orbit as well and where they're coming from. So the problem is a comet burns up within a few orbits because of the uh, amount of heat which is exerted on the comet from the sun, and that's why we uh, see them, or why they become visible to us, and why we know about them. Otherwise, there would just be you know bits of snow hurtling through space which are dark and de facto invisible so some comets have already broken up we could see that and uh, once they're broken up there's a lot of small pieces which might still stay in, in the orbit path uh, but they're not big enough to generate a tail and sometimes we, we might see them when the meteor showers come around this is when the earth just moves into uh, the path of an old broken up comet um, again if you look at 4.5 billion years of uh, the age of the solar system and we assume that pretty much everything was the same way as we as it is today then um, there would be no comets left because they, they would have all been burned up um, every comet loses quite a lot of substance as he as he orbits around the cloud and eventually they become so small that uh, that they just break into a lot of bits and that's the end of the comet that's the death of a comet um, so there's a problem where do all the comets come from uh, what is the answer uh, some scientists came up, uh, one guy by the name of Ort, uh, he came up and he said that somewhere in outer space between our sun and the next star, sort of suspended somewhere in space is the so-called Oort cloud. And in this cloud, you've got um, these dirty snowballs hovering around. Every now and then, one snowball gets knocked a bit and then he uh, starts hurtling towards the sun goes around an orbit and then shoots back to where it was coming from. So that's the idea they come up with. Um, but again, there's no proof, there's no nothing. But this is only a stopgap to try and explain why we've still got comets if we've got an old solar system. So there must be, uh, you know, some battery of comets, which every now and then releases some, and then they, they go into their orbit until they burn up, and then another one is getting kicked out and so on. Again, it's all assumptions, just a lot of assumptions. And this assumption was only made because there was a previous assumption of the solar system being old and the solar system being uh, 4.5 billion years old. Now, is it true? Is it not true? Uh, I'm trying to throw doubt on this. I don't believe it is true. I believe the evidence is overwhelming that the Earth is young and we are not looking at billions of years. Okay, comments point to young Earth. The fact that we have comments suggests the young age of the solar system. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of speculation around, and, and we need to be aware of this. Okay, I need to hurry up. I've got a few minutes left, and then um, we come to an end of this presentation. Um, Voyager found a volcano on Io. Io is a moon around Jupiter. Um, again, old solar system. There shouldn't be any volcanic activity on small bodies like the moon. It should all be cooled out, and especially that far out in the solar system. And um, it should just be called. There shouldn't be any geological activity. Um, the um, analogy here is uh, if, if I send you to a house and I say, oh, nobody's been living here for 10 years, you take the key, you open the door, and you find an ashtray with a smoking cigar, uh, which is still smoldering away, you know that somebody's been there a couple of hours ago. Um, who do you believe, me or the evidence you see? You know, the smoldering cigar... Uh, in the ashtray uh, and you you know yeah somebody must have been here not not long ago now we've got our smoldering cigar uh, orbiting jupiter and the smoldering cigar is called io um, suggests that it hasn't been left alone for uh, 4.5 billion years but it suggests that it's been not there for a very long time anyway scientists come up with a lot of ideas and trying to explain it away none of them work when you when you consider the laws of physics it just doesn't make sense. So we've got we've got massive problems. But uh, again, people just accept what these scientists serve uh, serve us on our plates, and we we eat it, uh, even though it might not be true and it might not be nourishing at all. Okay, uh, 
we've got a moon with a small mass. They cool out very fast. Uh, Voyager flew past Io and then, uh, surprise, surprise, there's a volcano on a moon. This is not possible. And they came up with gravitational pull and a couple of other theories. But when you analyze the theories, they don't add up. Yeah, because other moons, uh, they don't have this. And, and why? Why is it happening? Okay, the, the other th small drink cigar we have got uh, is on our moon as well. Quickly going back to our moon, to the moon. Um, there's a lot of, there are high levels of radioactivity, which should have decayed a long time ago. Um, and the levels of radioactivity suggest that the moon cannot be older than 50,000 years. Uh, uh, otherwise, it doesn't make sense why we've got this radioactivity there. So something is, um, is fairly fresh there. There are also isotopes uh, such as uh, U236 and TH230, which are short-lived isotopes. So that means they, they've got very short half-life times and they should just disintegrate, disappear, and you shouldn't be able to measure them. Now, they're still present on the moon. And it goes even further, they are very plentiful on the moon. So what's going on? Yeah. Doesn't make sense, defies the laws of physics. If you assume that the moon is 4.5 billion years old. If you assume that the moon is only thousands of years old, it's not a problem. That's what we are expected to find. Okay, rings of Saturn, and I'm coming to an end quickly now. Rings of Saturn, same problem. We've got pointing Robertson effect. So the rings should be very, very stable by now uh, due to the solar janitor. It's not. The rings on the moon are not stable. There are changes taking place all the time. And again, if you... Um, assume long age it should have all settled down and it should be um you know like a nicely greased engine it's not it's not just a picture of the rings on i think it was taken from voyager this picture rings of saturn and again they change all the time not all the time but changes have been seen and it shouldn't really be possible to see them not at this time um, so the rings are unstable, um, and as I said before, we've got the pointing Robertson effect, and it should have sorted out those rings. Um, and, and scientists come up with these statements about the solar system, that there's an apparent paradox, or it seems to violate known laws of physics. True. If you uh, have the wrong assumptions, and you start off with the wrong assumptions, then you get violation of the laws of physics. If you assume that uh, or if you are prepared to give up these assumptions and take the evidence and uh, interpret it in a new light and assume a young solar system, then it's not a problem. It's not a problem at all. It fits in nicely. Okay, what is the conclusion? The conclusion is we have got a lot of findings, uh, which are not a problem if you keep an open mind and accept the possibility of a young Earth, a young Moon and a young solar system. If we stick with uh, the 4.5 billion uh, idea, years idea, then we run into serious problems and nothing really works out. Uh, we've got existing evolutionary concepts which are based nothing but on assumptions. And then one assumption is based on another assumption and another assumption and another assumption. We've got this whole chain of, uh, of, uh, of, of facts and evidence which are not really facts and evidence because one um, piece of of so-called fact is based on an assumption which isn't hasn't been proven or cannot be proven. Um, evolutionary concepts concepts imply that nature is independent of a creator, which which again is is not true in my opinion. The concept of an act of uh, creation is belittled and seen as being unscientific. Yeah. So these guys come along and they say, you are all a little bit feeble-minded because you believe in a creator, you believe in, uh, in a God who's done all this stuff. And when you come up with uh, um, a young Earth scenario, this gets even worse. But the evidence is on our side. The facts which we see around us suggest a young Earth, not an old Earth. The facts around us suggest creation, not evolution. Uh, the facts for evolution are simply not there. All the crucial bits of uh, facts which we need to try and verify evolution, they, they are not there. They are not, they're simply not there. And if you interpret them slightly in a slightly different light, they all tumble down like a house of cards. Evidence uh, supporting a creationist view is ignored and disregarded by uh, the scientific community. Um, and that's, unsound, in my opinion, unsound science. So why is now no one picked up the... Uh, uh, evidence that dinosaurs and humans were contemporary. It's been totally ignored. 
totally and utterly ignored. It cannot be the case because it cannot be the case because we know they're hundreds of thousands of years apart or millions of years apart. Crazy. How do we know this? Yeah? The, the evidence is different. If you find human bones in the same layer as dinosaur bones, what do we make of it? It's a big question. Ignore it because it doesn't fit into our science or into the, uh, you know, what we've been studying for 150 years. Personal conclusion. That's my, my own conclusion. If creation is true, then there is a creator. By implication, your origin is from the creator. You are responsible to find out who he is and you have to prepare to meet him. Very easy. There's a creator. You are responsible. You have been created in the image of God. This means you are accountable to God. So you need to, to find out in your life who God is. And I don't care whether you're a Muslim, a Hindu, a Christian, uh, an agnostic or agnostic. You need to meet your God on a personal level. That, that, that is, there's no way around. Now, God has said that uh, the way to meet him is through Jesus Christ, through accepting what he has done, which is shedding his blood on the cross and uh, paying the price for your bad deeds, for the things which separate you from, from God and which stop you having a real relationship with God. So you need to come to, uh, to the point where you accept this and we accept Jesus Christ and you accept what he has done for you. And you say, Jesus, I believe that you have paid for, for everything I've done wrong. And I want to return. I want to return to God. I want to enter into a relationship with God. Um, through turning around, turning back, turning back on the way which is not good before God. And following God by meeting him head on through Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you to open your mind and, to, and your heart to, to seek God and to to look at this this option okay references check the bible read the book of genesis it's a lot of talk in there and uh, it's quite interesting as well when you look at it in the in the light of uh, the evidence we've got around us and the solar clocks uh, the book uh, a lot of information has been taken from is called it is young world after all by paul ackerman paul ackerman you can find his find uh, books uh, from him on the internet quite quite freely can download them, put them on your ebook reader and read them if you've got one. And um, there's also an updated version as well. So it's got, um, you've got, the book was written sometime in the 80s. Uh, you've got um, the updated version where um, new research has been added to it. And then some of the data which is presented has been slightly modified. Um, I've also been looking at Moon Dust and the Age of the Solar System by Andrew Snelling and David Rush. So uh, again, Google that and you get uh, their papers as well. Quite interesting read, very deep as well. Um, and it's exciting. Uh, our website is www.radioeden.com. My name is Michael. So you can email me at uh, info at radioeden.com. Okay, thanks for listening. And... Um, my desire for you is to just open your mind, uh, look at the clocks out in the universe and here on Earth, and uh, make up your own mind whether the scientists who tell you there is no God and uh, you are just uh, the descendant of a monkey, or whether the book that tells you that you have been made in the image of God and uh, that God has got a purpose and a plan and an eternal destination for you. It's your choice who you believe and who you go for. I hope you go for the latter one. God bless and bye-bye from Michael here at Radio Eden.